Hi everybody, welcome to Sprague Wood Turning. My name is Jim. If you haven't been here before, this is predominantly a turning channel where each and every week I show people how to make things on the lathe. Sometimes I do a little bit of flat work, but for the most part, if it doesn't go around on the lathe, I don't want to do it. So this week we're going to be working with something that's going to be maybe foreign to a lot of people, but not to the Australians. So let's move over to the casting bench and, and let's see what we're going to be doing this week. So my wife and I were in Ottawa this past weekend and I stopped in at my favorite wood store, KJP Select Hardwoods, and bought some really large Banksia pods. Uh, these, are, uh, these are some of the biggest ones I've seen. So I'm not exactly sure what we're gonna do with these, but uh, they, if you haven't seen them before, they're, they're pretty cool. I don't know if they just grow in Australia, but uh, they're a really neat looking thing. And of course, one of the more popular videos on my channel, the Banksia pod days, that's, uh, they came from Ernie. Ernie sent me some stabilized Banksia pods and uh, that's been a very popular video. So thanks again for that, Ernie. Uh, these are not stabilized. Uh, these were $14 each Canadian, so it's pretty close to uh, pretty close to $100 Canadian. <laughs> and I think that's the Australian dollar and the Canadian dollar I think is pretty much the same. So that gives you an idea. Uh, what am I going to do with these? I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm very tempted to cut them into sections and then place them into a plastic bowl mold and and do a pour like that. Uh, but anyway, like I know there's, oh, you should make pepper mills with them. No, I'm not making pepper mills with them. <laughs> uh, uh, if, you're, if you're not familiar, I don't like making pepper mills. They just suck the life right out of you. They do out of me anyway. So that was a little bit of a strange opening. Uh, I didn't realize it, but my camera had died. So <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, yeah, Banksia pods. Uh, first time I've really had a chance I shouldn't say it's the first time I've had a chance to buy large ones like this, but buy them locally. Uh, these ones actually still had some of the pods intact, which I thought was interesting. And there's actually some of that in the final piece as well. Uh, first thing I want to do is just clean these up on the wire brush. Uh, just, they're actually, when you rub your hands on the outside of them, they're kind of slick. So I wanted the, uh, the resin to have a good tooth to bond to. And with all those voids, I thought it was very important to blow them all out so you don't have any floaty bits afterwards as well. In order to cast these, I want to just kind of cut off the tops and the bottoms here. Just so that we got, I, I just didn't see the point of having these little nubs sticking out like that. And the fuzz, I wasn't ready for the fuzz you see here. I have no idea what that's called, but um, I'm assuming this might be one of the reasons why they stabilize them before before people typically use them. Anyway, it's always fun to work with weird and strange things that you've never worked with before. And this is certainly in that category. The ones that Ernie sent me were a lot smaller in diameter. So uh, they gave a total different look compared to what this is going to look like. I thought that was interesting. There's a hole right down through the center of the, uh, of the pod. Anyway, these are really, when they're in bloom, I, I, look, I looked them up and uh, they're absolutely beautiful when they're in bloom. So, uh, but something that's very, very foreign to Canada. You're not going to see any of those here, not that I know of anyway, possibly down in the southern U.S. I wanted to get rid of that fuzz because I wasn't sure if that was going to be an issue when we initially did the first casting on this. But uh, anyway, we'll soon be able to move on to... Uh, <laughs> arranging these in the bucket and getting some resin mixed up but anyway welcome to the welcome to the video and uh, hope you enjoy it all right now we got these cleaned up let's see if we can fit these in the bucket i am going to fit these in the orientation where i'm going to put the what was the top i'm going to put that down because the bucket's tapered and i think i'm going to need all the room i can get I wonder if this is why everybody stabilizes these. But we're going to try it without it. 
Hopefully that doesn't come back to bite us. There, that's pretty good. Let's mix up some resin. Well, I forgot to show it to the camera. We are going to be using deep casting epoxy from Designer Epoxy. Uh, again, just another weird start to this video. I know I was off my game uh, when I first started on this one. But uh, this, is, this is going to be a deep casting. And of course, you're going to need a deep casting epoxy to do that. And uh, deep cast from Designer Epoxy is certainly one of the best, if not the best. So as far as the color is concerned, uh, yesterday I asked the members what color they would like to see with these Banksia pods. And these were the three options I gave them. Emerald, emerald green, glitter purple, and titanium silver. Now, to be honest with you, I thought this was gonna be the winner. <laughs> but it's not, it's the purple. And I can't complain, I actually really love this color, but a very, very close second by one vote was the emerald green. So what we're gonna do is use the glitter purple as the primary resin, epoxy, and then we'll um, use the emerald green as an accent color. There were also a lot of comments amongst the members that these are Mardi Gras colors, and I'm like, okay, I. I've never been to Mardi Gras, so sure, <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, so anyway, I, th I thought that the green and the purple were good on their own. I didn't. I definitely want to use that titanium silver in a future project, but uh, can't argue with the, the results in this one. All right, here's the first liter and a half. Yeah, gonna take three of these easily. Uh, for this batch, I used my mechanical mixer. I noticed that where some pigment wasn't mixed in at the very bottom of this. But beware of them, because they do introduce a lot of air. But that's not an issue here, because this is gonna be going in the vacuum chamber. Yeah, I was wondering when they are gonna float. See? No pigment left. There, hope this is the last one. All right, vacuum chamber coming up next. Here we go. So after seeing the, the fuzz underneath the surface, the skin of, of these pods, I'm like, there's no way that this is going to be successful unless this goes into the vacuum chamber. So that's why I'm using the vacuum chamber. And, you know, I again, I, I see them in the comments every time I use the vacuum chamber. Like, why do you keep taking the vacuum on and off, on and off? Well, you know, if, if these pieces are submerged in the resin and when you pull a vacuum on it of course it pulls the air out and then when you release the vacuum it draws in the fluid so the more you do this your the bubble should be less and less and less eventually you'll see me i will leave the vent slightly open and it will stay at a level but you know you got to be you got to watch it like a hawk because if you walk away from it it can actually start to overflow and then you've got a big huge mess so this is this is one of the reasons why I do it this way and I know that people are like, oh, are you supposed to leave the vacuum on and stop playing with it but I've had great success with this and so why would I change it so anyway I'm gonna keep doing this for about another half hour and I'll bring you back when I'm done with that into the fridge you go So, you may have noticed or not that I keep my CA glue in here. Uh, it will last longer in the fridge, so I highly recommend putting uh, your CA glue in there. It'll keep a lot fresher. Very curious to see how much air is going to come out of this. 
if you haven't been here before, the reason why I'm using the fridge is to slow down the cure of the resin. This is an over pour, so deep cast is rated for four inches. This is, I think, is seven or something like that. So by placing the epoxy in the fridge, you'll slow the rate of cure and hopefully prevent thermal cracking. That's actually quite, quite interesting. I didn't think that, uh, I thought for sure there'd be a lot more air in it than that. The, uh, if I had to use the mechanical mixer, this thing would have just probably been bubbling over. So that shows you the difference between mechanical mixing and just mixing it by hand. The only problem is, I find that a lot of times it's really hard to mix in dry pigments when you're mixing it by hand. Sometimes it gets left behind on the bottom of the bucket and you don't see it till afterwards. But uh, that's pretty impressive. I, I didn't think, well, I thought there'd be a lot more bubbles than that. So anyway, I'm going to run this for about another five minutes and I'll throw this in the fridge with the other piece too. See you tomorrow. <sighs> well, good morning. It is 20 hours later. I just took these out of the fridge. And uh, let's get a reading on these. See what they are. 14.2 <laughs> Celsius is what these are. Let me check this one. Yeah, it's 15-ish. Larger volume, so it's going to be a little bigger, or higher in temperature. All right, so what we got to do now is get this out of here and get that, uh, that spacer. I'm hoping that when I take that that cover out of there, that the Banksia pods stay down and they don't float. That would be ideal, but let's find out. All right, so the next step is we're gonna inject the green into the blue. Uh, I should mention, you know, this is kind of a large scale experiment for me. We know that this epoxy can be controlled by time. So once it's mixed, it can, you know, you can basically set it in the heat for about 14 hours and then combine them and you're gonna get good color separation. Well, I wanna do the same thing, but I'm gonna use the cold this time. So, what I'm going to use is this syringe, and this is just some vinyl tubing, braided vinyl tubing. And I'm going to inject it down in between the pods here. And then we'll put this back in the fridge for another day, and then it'll go in the pressure pot. And then we'll see what our results are. I do like the fact that this comes with a little cap. So instead of trying to suck the fluid up through this here, should be able to just pour this in with any luck. I can hold on to it. Like so. Yeah, I can already. This is going to be messy. <coughs> I think it is anyway. this deep down inside the casting and then start injecting it while lifting it out. And I'm not going to stir that up at all. I'm just going to leave that the way it is. Let's try sucking this up to see how it works. And I know that you probably can't see all that well, but sorry, this is all I can do right now. So if you remember the ocean cave vase that I did here just recently, about three weeks ago or so, maybe a month, um, I, I used the fridge method because it was a really deep pour. 
and it was in the fridge for three days and it was quite tacky after that so i was thinking okay why can't you combine two colors and hopefully they're not going to mix when the resin's really cold because it's thick and uh let's see where the results are on it so that's that's kind of where this is all spawned from if you're curious <sighs> there that was good and messy now i'm already seeing kind of results that i like it's so cold that it's not combining at all together so hopefully by putting this back of the fridge for another day the resin will be firm enough cured enough <laughs> i guess it's probably a better choice of words for that uh that we can put it into the the pressure pot and then hopefully it will set the way it is but anyway i gotta get this back into where i want it to be and we'll get this back in the fridge it's too bad that i have to have this weight on because it would be nice to have a little resin pocket on the top of this that maybe we could make something with but I don't think that's going to happen. These pods just will not stay down. All right, well, that's it for today. Like I said, one more day in the fridge, then in the pressure pot. I'll keep an eye on it, and uh, we'll see how we make out. See you then. Uh, well, Early indications are saying that it's green, <laughs> but uh, I guess we'll figure it out. I know there was a lot of green sitting on the top, so when I push that spacer down in there, uh, I'm hoping that below that it's going to be purple, but we won't know that until we get it out. That looks a little purpley. Okay, well that's interesting. <laughs> Looks like it's down in here. It'd be interesting to see uh, down inside of the casting, but you know, it is strong purple on the bottom. But you can definitely see it down in there. All right, let's get some centers. That's pretty good. Top of that bucket's a little warped, so it ain't going to get any better than that. Starting off here with the number three Hercules from Hunter Tool Systems. There is a link in the description to them and, of course, all of my other sponsors. So head on down there and check them out. Along with that, there is Amazon links and other links, for instance, where I get my bandsaw blades and a bunch of other uh, tooling and other stuff like that supplies that i get from lee valley there's links down below the description so please check them out the green that's on the top of this i did hold on to these shavings um until i hit the mdf i don't want to get any mdf or any wood in those shavings so once i hit that then that was it for the for the shavings but i did manage to collect quite a few of them and yeah there's a uh, there's what you uh, you do when you do epoxy turning, resin turn. So you know the, the, again this what is resin and what is epoxy. You know as a general rule of thumb, resin is part A, and when you combine part B, that in turn makes epoxy. When you hear me talk about resin or epoxy, they're the same thing. But for instance, the UV resin, it's not an epoxy. It's actually a resin that's cured with UV light. So you know. I know that a lot of times I see this in the comments too, like like you say epoxy and then you say resin, like what is it and what is the difference? But I do realize that there are some other variations out there that was pointed out to me the last time that I, that I said this. But you know, when I say resin or epoxy, just know that I'm talking about the same thing. 
So what I want to do here is, is turn a tenon because we're going to reverse this and put a glue block on it like I typically always do. So that's what I'm doing here. Uh, I will say that um, the combination of this hardboard or this MDF, and if you've never worked with MDF, medium density fiber board, uh, it can be so hard that when you're running it, say you're through your table saw, you'll actually see sparks coming off your, your blades. It's, it's a real tool killer, if you will. And so are these Banksia pots. I'm telling you right now, these things are hard. But uh, a very cool look and very lizard, dragon skin-ish look to them in this piece. And I absolutely, truly love it. Hopefully you guys do as well. And if you're liking what you're seeing right now, I'll let you know that there are playlists on my channel and where you can view content like this. Uh, along with that, uh, you know, hitting that subscribe button really helps me out. That thumbs up button, of course, is, 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 is important as well. Uh, people don't really fully understand the, the algorithm, and I'm one of them. <laughs> but, but I know that by leaving a comment down below and by hitting that thumbs up button certainly will help YouTube push my content to others. So that would be much appreciated if you can do that. And, you know, again, most of the people that are watching my videos aren't subscribed. So please hit that subscribe button. And uh, that way we can, you know, give some more stuff away. Right now, I do giveaways at every 5,000 subscribers. I may have to move that to 10 because it's coming faster and faster. And, and uh, but hey, that's great. Thank you so much. Please subscribe. I, I, I would really appreciate that. Uh, the algorithm, uh, it's just... It's so important for a YouTuber to be in, be in the favorable side of the algorithm. Uh, if not, it really affects your channel. So thanks for that. So like it is each and every time that I do something like this, all I'm doing is getting rid of the excess epoxy, uh, trying to expose whatever is, is inside of that. Coming out of the pressure pot, I had some real genuine fears that I was going to have a, quite a mess on my hands in regards to that the fuzzy material that that i pointed out earlier hopefully i was i was thinking you know hopefully this is going to be all good to go and <laughs> and it's not going to cause too many issues and it really didn't but anyway we're just going to reverse this now I'll clean this off and then i'll get a glue block on the bottom uh the uh <laughs> the last time i did a banksia pod project i i mispronounced banksia pod now i'm not from australia and you know my english isn't the best on most days but uh man did i take it large from the aussies <laughs> i'm still every now and then i think i shot that video two years ago and then every now and then <laughs> there's there's an aussie you know, chimes in and goes that's not how you say it what's wrong with you <laughs> so anyway hopefully i don't screw up the pronunciation on it this time around just doing some final trimming here on the bottom and of course using some 60 grit to rough up the surface before the glue block goes on and that is an end grain uh, waste block that I'm putting on there and of course there's there's my method right there that's an electric frying pan with the glue and I'm just going to use the five beats bowl gouge here to clean this up and then you'll see me switch out to the parting tool so we got a nice crisp sh shoulder here for the jaws to sit against uh, and then we'll be able to get this reversed once it's reversed, you know, and it's in, mounted in the chuck, this is a much, much safer way to turn than just pinching it between centers. But, you know, that's typically why I always like to get down to solid wood when I pinch things between centers. And uh, so the sooner you can get it, that glue block on there and mount it in the, in the chuck like that, very, very unlikely that it's going to come apart or, sorry, come off the lathe. And the last thing that we're going to do here before we talk about this piece is just true this up. Uh, I did want to expose a lot more pod surface because there wasn't really a whole lot showing at this point, And we certainly will in the future here. But a very cool looking piece and I hope, hopefully you guys really like it too. Well, all right, it is decision time. Uh, first impressions from these uh, is just absolutely dinosaur skin lookish type stuff uh very very cool but i'm now seeing why i think 
they stabilize these. So here, let me get that other piece over here. So when I cut these on the uh, chop saw, of course, I noticed all this fuzz. I'm like, hmm, yeah, that could be an issue. So I can see where we've got some resin penetration into, I would say, three quarters of it. But, you know, probably the deeper you go into these pods, the less likelihood you're going to get this. I think for the most part, this is, I mean, it's just on the kind of the outside edge of it. So a lot of it may get turned away anyway. Um, Got to be really careful here, though, because if you look at these openings, well, they don't go in real deep. So I think what I'm going to do is... This is either going to be like an enclosed bowl or a hollow form, but I'm just going to, you know, I, I don't want to get too deep into this. I want this patterning to be at least in the center of this piece. So, of course, the deeper we go into this, we're going to lose more of that. So that's a consideration. Uh, let me wipe this off with some denatured alcohol. Well, that'll give you an idea what the resin's going to look like. And it's a little hard to see. It depends on where the light hits it. There's definitely green in it. There's a big streak right here. And I don't know if that camera's going to pick that up or not. It is 100% purple dominated. There's no doubt about it. Here's a lot of green at the top. And you can see some right there. Um... There may be more deeper inside to this, we'll have to see. But wherever you see it kind of dark like that, that there is whatever this fuzz is called. <laughs> That's what's uh, causing that color variation. And where it isn't, that's where the resin has penetrated it. I don't see this as a big deal. <laughs> I shouldn't say that right now, but I don't see this as a big deal right now because what we can do to correct this is use some resin coats and that should fill in all these areas and solidify all this stuff. So I'm not overly concerned about that right now. So what I'm gonna do right now is turn this foot down to where we wanna be, um, do a little bit of shaping on the top and then we'll, uh, we'll go from there. But when I'm looking at it this way, I can definitely see the green in it but it's just not real strong right there. And I don't imagine the camera's picking it up. It's not real strong. Anyway, let's bash on. So I think that having this enclosed bowl like it is was gonna really showcase these pods the best way and keep that, that skin, dragon skin, like whatever you wanna call it, lizard, dinosaur, uh i don't know it's just it's just a really cool look but i i knew that the deeper that i got into this piece that those pe those those little openings were going to get smaller and smaller and then eventually disappear and you can kind of see that on the top and the bottom when you when you're when i'm whittling this away that uh it's kind of neat though because on the top you'll actually see the hearts of the banksia pods so that gives you another different visual look so that that's really cool as well but uh, yeah, this stuff is a tool killer. I, uh, I put a new cutter on this about halfway through here. The cutter is still good, but I just, I just found that um, the carbide cutter wasn't working all that well. And uh, I mean, it had two projects on it before that. So <laughs> I figured it was time to change it anyway. But uh, I don't know, cutting this stuff with a gouge would be very challenging and you'd be at the, you'd be at the, uh, the sharpener all the time when working on this and I, i'm kind of curious about other people's experiences if they've turned large pods like this in this kind of configuration to to see what they turned it with and if they use the gouge like how how successful they were in you know compared to what carbide would give you like i'm using here from hunter tools so speaking of densities uh there were some people that wanted me to cover basically wood densities and you know I prefer to work with woods that have higher densities than say uh, woods like 
birch, soft maple. Soft maple is actually quite nice to work with, but birch and poplar, uh, a lot of those, that species, types of species, certainly is, is, is not as, it's easy to cut, but it's hard to cut cleanly. You have to have really sharp tools when you're working with really soft woods. And, and, and that's just to prevent all the tear that maybe you're going to get. So you may typically sharpen more often when you're working with softer woods where this here will definitely take the edge off your tool, but this is not a normal turning thing. Uh, these pods are super hard. And of course the epoxy is in that category too. So uh, I actually prefer to work with say hard maple but you know your tooling has to be really good with it or else you're going to do a lot of sanding to get rid of any you know lumps and bumps within the piece so that you know it, it it's got its drawbacks and it's it's got its benefits really both both soft and hardwoods when you're working with them on the lathe we'll talk a little more about this after so anyway i'm going to drill this out um by this stage I had figured out that I'm just going to do an enclosed bowl. I thought that that would be something that would really show off these pods nicely. Yes, I could have done a hollow form. Some may even say that I should have done a hollow form with this. And, um, but I don't know. I, I, we haven't really done an enclosed bowl in a while. So I figured that we would do that this week. I think that is a two inch bit is what I ended up going to, but I was having a hard time even drilling, drilling with this stuff. It was like, man, this is, these are brand new Forstner bits. And one of them, it was just smoking up pretty badly. So I was like, wow. Yeah. This one right here, it just does not like to be drilled. All right, so before we carry on with this week's project, I just wanted to show you this. I, I ran out of my gloss Waterlux original here, and um, it's just not readily available here in Canada. I can get the medium sheen easy enough, but I can't get the gloss, uh, and I do prefer to work with the gloss. So I had to buy this out of the US uh, from DK Hardware Supply. And uh, for these two cans, there's, uh, what are they, 946 milliliters. So not even two liters of this stuff was $135 US. So it's, it's a very pricey finish to get here in Canada. I don't know what people in the States are paying for this, but man, it's expensive. But you know, this is the best finish that I've ever worked with. And the great thing with it is, I mean, it builds quickly and it just gives you that super shine that I'm looking for. And along with that, you know, it's non-toxic when it's fully cured. So, you know, it's, it's a straight up bonus. So anyway, that's painful. Uh, if you've got a cheaper source, please let me know. I would really appreciate it. The other thing is I got some aluminum shavings in from Nathan. Uh, Nathan is a CNC operator, machinist, something like that. Uh, he sent me two sizes, uh, so that's great. We're gonna, these will look fantastic in the rim. If you remember, uh, the, the aluminum powder that I used looks more like body fill than it does aluminum. <laughs> so we'll definitely do an inlay in the rim with this. But I'm also thinking um, down inside of hollow forms and castings, you know, just to make our lives really miserable because uh, Nathan says that this is uh, 6061, which I'm assuming is a fairly hard aluminum since it's, uh, he said it was uh, used in the aerospace instrument components. So uh, anyway, um, it's probably the harder, without even looking this up, I'm gonna assume, anytime there's aircraft attached to things, I know that it's a good quality aluminum that they use. Uh, anyway, they've got um, the coolant on them, so I'm going to have to clean them with soap and water. And th anyway, that's what Nathan says to do. He says, hey, anyway, if you're reading this, then they finally arrived. Hope they perform better than the powdered aluminum. I'm sure they will. Um, anyway, uh, I'm not going to read all of this, but thanks again, Nathan. Uh, I really do appreciate it. It's, uh, it's really cool. Uh, the, the Hercules... Any carbide tools should cut this pretty cleanly, <laughs> I'm hoping, but we'll find out. All right, well, that's it. Thanks again, Nathan. 
We will, uh, let's get back to uh, what we're doing. Still getting a lot of questions about this. This is the power cap by JSP and uh, I believe they're a UK company. And I got this one from Peak Safety in the US. That's P-E-K-E. -E. So I've got this mounted outboard now and my intention certainly was to hollow this outboard uh, and by hand and not use the rig. So some people have commented, you know, when I'm turning, you'll sometimes you'll see a polished area like there is near the back of this piece. And then, of course, the other it's kind of like a, a matte finish. And that's simply just because the bevel of the tool is rubbing on the surface of the wood and it polishes the resin in the wood. So right there where I just whittled it away. And then, of course, when the cutter, like now, when there's no double bevel rubbing on the surface, then it's going to give you a more matte finish. Now I personally find harder woods, and, and we'll classify these pods as being in that category, uh, you tend to get more chatter, and chatter is, uh, I'll call it vibration, <laughs> basically the, the, the wood is vibrating and it's, it's kind of skipping on the cutter, and you know, I, here, I, here I'm noticing it and I'm trying different things to try and sometimes I put my, my hands on the outside of, of the uh, the bowl to try and calm that down a little bit and that wasn't doing anything. But uh, this next clip, I've got the volume turned up to 50% and you'll hear what I mean by chatter. You may have heard my displeasure there. So now I'm going to do it where the bevel is rubbing and you're going to see a noticeable difference. Now that is only 50% volume. <laughs> so it's, I, I had to wear some hearing protection here because it was, uh, it was actually really, really loud. And I, uh, you know, that is, the bevel is supporting the cutting edge. So it's kind of, when the wood hits the cutter, it's pushing the bevel into the wood and it's helping to eliminate some of that chatter. There's still a little bit there, but it's not as bad as when the cutter is being used unsupported. Uh, when it when the cutter was being used unsupported, it was absolutely brutal. I was also, I was also a little deeper into the bowl as well, so you're going to typically get less chatter the deeper you go into something like this. But out near the top, yeah, that's where you're going to get see the most chatter. But, I, you know, I've noticed this over the years and I thought that I would point that out. You know, if you can use a cutter and use it where you've got a bevel supporting the cutter, typically you're not going to get as much um, chatter than you would use it when it's not supported. All right, so I thought I was going to be able to do this outboard, <laughs> but um, no. And I'm going to tell you something right now. If you've never turned this stuff before, it is hard. Hard. It's harder than burl. And I think this is why I'm getting so much vibration. It's terrible. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I guess I should have checked to see if the Hercules could reach the bottom, and it can't. So that's another issue. <laughs> So uh, I was really wanting to do the inside of this by hand, but we're going to have to use the coring rig because I just can't get in there and my hands are vibrating like you wouldn't believe. All right, I'll bring it back when I got it all set up and board. We are all set up and ready to hollow out this dinosaur looking piece. <laughs> this is the retrofit tool from Hunter Tool Systems. 
if you do any hollowing, I recommend getting this. This actually, we'll be able to see this uh, good because we've got a, quite an open form here. And of course, there is a laser mounted above here if you haven't seen this before. And right now, I don't know, it's, I didn't measure that. That's probably like an inch. So the idea is when that laser slips off the outside of the form, that means you've achieved the wall thickness that you have set. Uh, the other thing is, uh, one of my previous videos, I mentioned that, you know, you got to be careful that this, if, it, if you go too far with the rig this way, this could slip out of these captive bars in the back. So my temporary fix right now is just to put this small C-clamp on there. That should prevent that. But I noticed that this is hollow. So what I'm going to do is tap this, put a bolt with a big washer in it, and then that way it can't fall out in the future. And, it, you know, when you want to remove the rig, it's just a matter of unscrewing it and then sliding the rig out and then you know you can you can do whatever you need to do with it uh and of course we got the steady rest set up because uh if we don't the way my day's been going so far that is going to go across the shop and uh, we don't want that to happen all right let's see how we make out here so as you watch me use the retrofit tool here from hunter tool systems uh give you a little update on the house we did have a showing uh, the house wasn't for them, so uh, we we fully expect that to, to happen. Uh, uh, I do, I think that what I'm going to do is make possibly a separate video if I can. I have our my garage shop plans electronically, and I'm going to see if I can somehow do that into a video and, and give you the layout, the, the actually the, the look of the future workshop is um, probably going to be very similar to the one that I have now. It's going to have a dormer on the face of it. Uh, but anyway, the layout is going to be slightly different. And I'm going to have a washroom. That's going to be just a super bonus to have that out there. Uh, you, the big thing with epoxy, especially in the wintertime here in Canada, uh, if you don't have your epoxy stored in a very warm place when you go to use it, especially if it's a one-to-one, -one, it's going to be really thick. And it doesn't matter what epoxy you're using, all one-to-one, -one, epoxies are, are very thick so having uh you know the hot water out there where you can set the the resin jugs in it to warm them up prior to prior to use them is going to be a super bonus so i'm really looking forward to that uh i thought that i would show the sharpening of the teardrop cutter now i got my fat fingers in the way for for some of this but that was just a diamond coated uh wheel dresser that i was using before this and um I just set the tool rest the same as the cutter when it comes from one way and it's it's quite simple to, to sharpen not hard at all so there it is again I thought I'd show it before I throw it back on so I started with the retrofit tool uh, on the sides eventually I will put in the extension that goes on this as well but I'm using the teardrop cutter here mostly in the bottom of this I find it's easier to use than, say, the retrofit tool is to, to try and come across the bottom. And, of course, the great thing is, since we have an, an open form here, I can look in and adjust the, the tool rest to the proper height. And, again, you want that cutter just be hitting right at center. I mean, ideally, it would be perfectly at center. If not, just very, very slightly below it. And you'll feel it. If you just shut... If you shut the lathe off and you put that extension all the way down on the bottom and you kind of pull it across the bottom, you'll feel if there's a hump there. So you just play with your, your height of your tool rest and then eventually you'll be able to get that and, and, and delete it. So that's kind of what I was doing there. So there's a good shot of what it looks like inside. I remember to move my, my hand out of the way for that. There's the extension that bolts onto the large boring bar. And uh, I didn't need to use any curved cutting bars for this due to the fact that it was open as much as it was. But I was having a little bit of issues right at the very top as far as trying to keep the, the cutter running. I thought I'd set up this light and try that. Um, it was okay. Better than, better than no light, I suppose. Uh, I, I, you know, the funny thing is when, when you can see inside of these things, it's so hard not to be bent over the whole time doing this and looking inside of it. So at the end of the day, you may end up with a sore back, but at least you can kind of see what's going on on the inside of it. And of course, doing some some manual uh, measuring with, with the uh, calipers is 
is very important as well. Not so much on the side because I have the laser on the side to guide me, but near the bottom, and I know you can configure this to use the laser on the bottom too, but sometimes I just prefer to measure it by hand and, and just to take any guesswork out of it. And another thing that I need to talk about is commission work. Uh, still getting contacted by a lot of people looking for commissions, and I'm sorry, I just can't take on any more commissions than what I have now. Uh, I'm just, between shooting these videos, I just don't have any time for production work. If it's a very unique thing you're looking for and it's something I can film, then possibly, but you know, I, I've got a long commission list as it is right now, and I, I need to fulfill those orders before I can take more. All right, I'm gonna give you a look inside. You know, I'm reasonably happy with that. Can't really complain all that much about that. But <laughs> if you're a regular viewer to my channel, you may notice this. This is where the wheels are running. And last time, you know, we weren't 100% sure what was causing it. Like that is still hot. Like it's like this is cold, both sides of that. But right here where them wheels are rubbing, it's actually quite hot and it's still kind of pliable. So that's what happens. If I had the wheels up here where they were sitting flat up here, then I don't think that we would get this. But the way the wheels come into this, they kind of push backwards on it. And that, of course, is what I want because if it's pushing back on the piece as it's running, then very unlikely that this is going to come out of the chuck. But if it's up here, then if you're on the high point of the piece, then it certainly can. So that's why I like to put the uh, the steady rest wheels in spots like this. Uh, what I'm going to have to do is let that cool down and harden up again. And then I'm going to have to trim this. I realize that this is a little thicker than maybe we want it to be. But I don't know how much trimming I'm going to have to do on the outside here before uh here hopefully you can see it good there now before we uh delete that so i'm happy with that wall thickness i know some people want to go thick uh thinner than that but uh not me i'm good there's a little sneak peek too so we're mounted back outboard again uh I had no idea how deep that was. The uh, last time that happened was on the ocean cave vase, and it was about, I think I'd take off about an eighth of an inch to, uh, to to delete it. So I was thinking to myself, okay, we're coming up on a half inch here. If I need to take more than, than a, you know, an eighth of an inch off here, I, I just don't want to go any thinner than, than it already was because we still have to do sanding. And, you know, a lot of, you may not understand, but you can actually sand away a lot of thickness on a piece just in the sanding process so you know that that's another consideration when you're when you're turning pieces like this always leave enough material there that you've got enough material to sand it to get rid of all your little lumps and bumps and tear out and in this kind of business anyway eventually i do delete this it uh every every pass i took on it it got less and less and i was uh i was very happy about that because the last time when i seen that in the ocean cave days i was really disappointed so there you can still see it, but it's getting less. So so <laughs> that was encouraging at the time. Uh, maybe the next time uh, I'll put them on the high point and and we'll we'll see what happens there. It is a little bit of a coincidence, maybe that both of these pieces were in the fridge and this happened. Maybe this resin needed or this epoxy needed to sit another day before I worked on it. That possibly could be maybe a day or two. Uh, I've been contacted by people that said that, you know, they let them sit for almost five days before or longer before turning them. But anyway, eventually I delete it. Happy days. We're still got a beautiful piece. You see that white spot? That's a seed. Since we're mounted outboard, of course, things aren't running as true as they were before. So that's all I'm doing here on the opening. I, I figured, well, okay, I'm here. I'm going to try the Hercules and, and just try and smooth smooth the wall a little bit more what i could reach with the hercules 
and then you'll see me switch out to the uh, the bowl gouge. Of course, it's got it's longer. Uh, both the the tool, the steel is longer, and of course the handle is longer. So you've got some pretty good mechanical advantage and can hold on to it. So just cleaned up the bottom a little bit, and then we'll be able to move on to some sanding here. These are the three and a half inch dipple discs from Sandpaper.ca. Absolutely love these discs. Highly recommend them. They're they're a great price, uh, and great value for for you know what you pay for them, and. Um, this was sanded from 60 to 180 and then we've still got some little voids to address and uh but you know overall i'm actually really surprised at how little fixing i had to do on this piece all right uh, i don't know how the camera's going to pick this up or not but i got a bunch of these little voids here and uh <laughs> i think that there's seed seeds that are left behind because they're white uh, another little spot there uh there's actually a really large one <laughs> i don't know if the camera's gonna pick that up or not right in there and the other weird thing is when you when you look in here you know it all looks good except for down at the bottom there's a couple of little voids down there and that one looks good too and then you get to this one and it's right full of tiny little voids so i think what i'm going to do and there's a big void right down to the very bottom of it too so anyway what i'm going to do is use the uv resin from designer epoxy and uh, we'll cure this up with a uv light and then we'll be able to give this one more sanding of 180 and then move on to what we're going to do next this uv resin is amazing stuff i'm so glad i've got this now it really you know you, you could have filled these voids with ca glue but then you run the risk of maybe getting some air in it and so this is a better option all right so all i'm going to do there is just use the uv light to cure this and uh, like i said we'll give us another little sanding and then we'll move on to the next step all right what i have here is three ounces of the pro series and that should fill in all these little holes and hopefully solidify all those areas where that fuzz material is and uh i really start to use a lot of this for my first coat so you might want to consider doing that anyway it's uh the pro series from designer epoxy and this is a silicone barbecue brush so moving forward when I'm working with difficult woods or kind of oddity pieces like this, I'm going to be using a lot more of these epoxy coats. Uh, this is a huge benefit to do this. Uh, you will probably definitely get away without, with less coats of finish. That's, that's probably a big bonus to this method. But you know, all these little fuzz areas that needed to be filled in, it would have taken you forever to do that with the CA glue. And then maybe you're fighting some bubbles that you're getting in it when you're curing it. So I think that the epoxy here is the only way to do these pieces for me going forward. Well, I'll tell you something right now. That is one of the coolest things I've made. Look at those pods and look at the resin. Crazy. to see on the inside I mean just come on Let's get some light here just amazing and that resin I just I don't see any of the green at all yeah, there is. You can see little hints of it. When you, when you look at it correctly, I can see it right here. Very, very cool. I'm going to throw this back on the lathe and uh, use the torch on it. I'm actually really surprised I'm not seeing more air coming out of these pods where, that, where the furry stuff is. But... Uh, 
Really cool. Need more Banksia pots. Another common question I get is why don't I use a heat gun when I'm trying to pop bubbles in a very dusty shop like mine is. You can do your best to get rid of the dust that's inside of that. As soon as you turn it on, it's going to be covered in dust. All right, I'm just going to watch this for about another 10 or 15 minutes. And then um, when that's done, it'll go in my clean room overnight where the heat is. And we'll put our first coat of finish on tomorrow. Well, technically, I guess our second coat. Anyway, we'll see you then. Well, okay, it is in fact the next day. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I'm quite surprised that there's no bubbles. Uh, you can tell where, you know, the, the epoxy has sunk into the piece, but uh, there's no bubbles, so that's kind of cool. Inside did a really good job doing that. I'm very pleased with that and of course that epoxy just whew. so anyway with the plan today is I'm gonna start sanding this at 220 we'll go all the way to 800 and then we'll get our first coat of water looks on it been a few questions about the hearing protection that I'm using and there it is there uh, I get that from Lee Valley they're actually there's not a link for that I don't think in the description but just go to their website and do a search for hearing protection and I'm sure they will come up. Uh, the reason why I like them is they're, there's really large ends on them and they don't dig into your ear canal, which is something that I find quite irritating. I thought I would show these. Uh, that's a small little buff. You can get that from the Beale buffing system. And again, I got that from Lee Valley. And... Uh, there was no way you were going to get a large buffing pad inside of there. So this is really your only option when it comes to that. And I thought I would show this too. That's the normal buffing pad that I use. And again, I got that at Lee Valley. And if you ever need to change something, then you can just mount it in the vise and then unscrew the nut. It does gall the threads up, but I just put it in the drill. That's how I do it. And don't forget that denatured alcohol because it's quite dirty if you don't. All right, this is the first coat of Waterlux Gloss. Hopefully it poured out enough. The other common question I get is what I'm using to apply the finishes, and these are just old t-shirt material. Uh, I did buy some proper rags for finishing, but uh, old t-shirt material works great. Well, there you go. Crazy. This thing is just, it's crazy. <laughs> the whole thing is, the look of it is just wild. Look at that resin. And our dragon skin. Let's call it dragon skin. <laughs> Banksia pods. It is beautiful and I absolutely love it. Here's the inside, if you can see it. Uh, by doing that epoxy coat, it has filled in all of those areas. So it's the surface is actually pretty close to being flawless. It's definitely going to need another coat, but I think two coats of the gloss is going to do it. So I'll do the second coat the same way, and we'll see you when doing the bottom. Let me know in the comments what you think about this strange thing. <laughs> Finally on to doing the foot here. Uh, I had lots of focusing, camera focusing issues, so I cut a ton of footage out here. Anyway, thanks to all those who have watched the entire video. I really do appreciate it. Uh, it means a lot to me. Uh, let's have a last little chat about this very unique enclosed bowl. Well, it's going to be interesting to see what people got to say about this. Uh, it's, it's really dark, so it's hard to film. <laughs> uh, just those pods are just so cool. And the resin is just spectacular. Two coats of Waterlux and, of course, the coat of the Pro Series. There's the bottom. I decided to engrave on the resin. And the great thing about that is, so when the finish is applied to this, it will 
the ghosting of it will be there. You can read it quite easily, but when you hold it up and look at it through the light, you're not, probably not going to be able to see the signature all that much. Speaking of that, there's the inside. Uh, size on this. At its widest dimension, I'll put the metric conversion up on the screen. Uh, eight inches across, six and a quarter inches tall, and like I said earlier, about a half inch in thickness. Uh, this is for sale. If you're uh, interested in this, send me an email to spraguewoodturning at gmail.com and I'll disclose the price in that way, you know, in case it's a gift. Uh, when you look at this and you just, the light's got to catch it the right way, you can just see a little hint of green in it. And um, so, you know, there seems to be a lot of pearl effect in here more than usual. And I'm going to assume that's probably got a lot to do with the emerald green that's in there. Uh, so what's the solution to that? Uh, moving forward, I mean, this isn't going to be the last time we're going to be using this. Uh, I'm going to mix the, the accent color extremely strong, heavy, heavy pigment. And I think that if you do it that way, that it'll show up a lot better. And along with that, you know, maybe leaving it in the fridge for two days and then doing it will give us a different result as well. There's all kinds of variables that it could be, but you know, I'm gonna set this down here. Uh, having it in the fridge a little longer, um, I don't know, there, there's all kinds of things that it, that it really could be. Uh, maybe if you put the accent color in a day before, there's, I mean, there's just different variables. And you know, while this was an experiment, people are gonna wonder, well, why didn't I do this on a smaller scale? The problem with doing it on a smaller scale is the epoxy larger volumes will cure differently. So you really, you really can't do it on a smaller scale to get kind of the result you're looking for. So that's why I didn't do like a small scale experiment because the epoxies will cure at different rates. So larger volumes, it's gonna cure faster typically than smaller volumes. Anyway, please leave a comment down below and uh, we can certainly discuss all this. Uh, and again, to be entered into the designer epoxy draw at 120,000 subscribers, just put designer epoxy down below. And of course, that's only for continental USA and Canada. And by putting a comment down below, you'll also be entered into my giveaway at 120,000 subscribers as well. So please do that. Uh, next week, I don't know what we're going to do next week. I haven't, I've got nothing poured and I'm kind of panicking a little bit about that because I'm kind of running out of time. Uh, maybe we'll try and do something with ArtCast next week. Uh, maybe maybe even some of the, um, the aluminum shavings. I don't know, I'll have to give it some thought. All right, well, anyway, hopefully it's something cool. So please come on back for that uh, next week. Anyway, take care, stay safe, don't forget the bell, please share my videos with your friends. That is one of the largest way for me to, ways to, for me to build my presence here on YouTube. And of course, by leaving a comment down below and that thumbs up will also help with the analytics, like I said earlier. All right, see you next week.